Repton is actually rare in Wales. We only have three certain landscapes by him that are connected with a red book. And these are the landscapes that I'm going to talk about today. Um, it's interesting because he did do a lot of work in Cheshire and, Sh and Shropshire and along the borders. And of course he got tied up very closely with the um, controversy with picturesque, with um, Ulverdale, Price and Payne Knight. And I think those issues were very much part of some of the Welsh landscapes. The first one I'm going to talk about is Rig. Rig is in the Dee Valley. It's, um, it lies between Corwen and Bala, and it's now the home of Lord Newborough. Um, it was commissioned in 1784-85, and it's the first real um, landscape by Repton in Wales. Um, this is what you see today. Um, there's some terracing down to a lake. And that's, that's another view of the lakeside that survives today. So it's a very attractive landscape. It's not a massive landscape. And I think a lot of what Repton did is still very visible today. This is the old house that was um, described by Pennant just before Repton um, was involved. And you can see it was a rambling... Um, sort of Elizabethan house, quite large, and obviously evolved over many years. And it really didn't have a massive um, landscape around it or a parkland. But it does have this strange sort of hill feature, which you can see um, on the right-hand side. So if you try and remember that, and remember this sort of rambling house... This is another, feature, uh, another picture showing the old house, and so you can see the needed transformation. You can see that it's quite near the water. Um, there must have been already a substantial river, and you see these two strange fish ponds um, on the right-hand side. And so Repton um, was commissioned, and he decides to take um, this rambling old property um, in hand. And he produces a red book. And it's one of the books, he says, um, was largely carried out in almost every detail. Um, you can see that there's quite a, a large kitchen garden. That's already established. He doesn't design that. But the house, you can see he moves it um, quite considerably. And he gets rid of the old fish ponds. And he creates a much bigger lake. And then he moves the house closer towards the, um, the kitchen garden and ca carries out quite a lo lot of um, planting, a sort of woodland shelter belt around the house. This is the mound that's part of the landscape. And it's really, I think, surprising that this doesn't actually feature in his design for the Rig landscape. This is perhaps because it wasn't properly appreciated at the time, and perhaps it was thought to be part of an old landscape as a viewing mount. It's actually rather large. It was an old castle, a mot, that was um, built on top of an old cairn. And it wasn't until um, much later in the 19th century that it was excavated in order to make an ice house. And then they discovered Bronze Age um, remains. So it was quite an interesting feature. And it's perhaps odd that it's completely um, removed from, from the, the Repton landscape. So these are some pictures from the Red Book. Um, you can see in the top the old house. You can see um, where the old fish ponds are. And then below, you can see um, with his flap removed, you can see where he wants to put the new house. And the new house, you can see, is a phenomenal, big, new, um, modern, gothic design. And in his red book, he talks a lot about the terrible weather in Wales. I think he must have had a visit at the wrong time of year. And he also um, talks about how he thinks gothic is suitable for the climate. Um, and where, where you have the old house... You can see that originally it was quite near a cascade and the pond perhaps wasn't very big. And he gets rid of this cascade. He wants to move it down and enlarge the lake. 
And I think just to this side, you can get the sense of the mound, just a little bit um, of the mound. But he basically, at Rieg, he does a fantastic drainage scheme, which I think was influenced by his friend Charles Townley, um, who, he, who wrote about how to drain agricultural land. And I think at Rieg, he was very keen to get rid of what he describes on his map as the boggy ground. Where the old house is, he wants to replace it with this um, pavilion or fishing room. And you can see that the, the mound is sort of screened by the tree. He's not really interested in that. He's interested in, in the woodlands behind and making a much more um, pastoral view. So there's a lot of interest in how he can improve, I think, on nature in what he thought was wild, rugged, mountainous Welsh landscape. And then there's a number of pictures which show these old fish ponds and what he considered the boggy ground, sort of looking across towards the old um, the dovecote, which he does seem to want to keep. And the little house here is where he wants to site the new mansion, and that was really just a dog kennel. So there's a number of views, all of them centred on this drainage scheme, huge drainage scheme, and getting rid of fences and improving the, the water landscape. And it pretty much is the same shape today. And there is a bridge. There's actually a, an island. The bridge actually links across the island. But um, by and large, the Rig landscape is a Repton landscape still today. So this was the, the building that he wanted with a much bigger lake with a boat on it. And the house, though, he didn't get the house of his dreams. In the Red Book, there's this very rough sketch, and it's a bit of a mystery who built Rieg, whether it was a Repton design or not. It's been suggested that Repton did this sketch um, because it is in his Red Book. But um, he actually talks about... Um, how he'd done the Red Book before his son, A.D., was properly qualified as an architect. And he says that it was actually um, designed by Wilkins. Um, so the design that was rejected was the Wilkins Gothic design. And so we're still not absolutely sure who, who designed Rieg, the, house, the house at Rieg. But that's what you see today. And... And there's been a certain amount of work done in the walled garden, which now has a tennis court and a solar farm. And Lord Newborough is extremely green, so the house is powered with electricity from the lake as well. But, um, but the landscape behind and the plantations, it's all very much, I think, as Repton originally designed. Now we go on to look at Plas Neweth and Anglesey. Um, Plas Neweth, I think, was perhaps one of the more frustrating properties for Rieg, for, for Repton, because unlike Rieg, um, quite a bit of work had already been started. Um, Lord Littleton had first identified its potential as being turned into a fine landscape. Um, the one thing about um, Plas Neweth is, of course, there's no need for a water feature. It's right on the Menai Strait, so it faces over the Menai Strait, and, and this is the view from the Peacock's repository. Oh. This is another picture. This shows the house before Repton, and you can see it was sort of gothic. It had crenellations around the roof line. It had quite a lot of planting done around it, and um, the footpath down to the waterside. But um, it was decided that this actually was rather old-fashioned as a house. And so in the 90s, it was, um, it was sort of modernized, mainly with James Wyatt. But Joseph Potter was involved in, in some of it, and certainly the outbuildings. This is what you see today. So you can see how, how the castellated, sort of more Gothic design was changed with a more severe front. Um, and it's rendered, and it's 
got a plantation which sort of breaks up the front. And this is the, the water side facing the Menai Strait. You see it's quite a steep slope from the terrace where the house stands. And I think the reason why the house was screened and sort of almost divided up with um, a lot of planting is because this stables have been built by Potter. And it's really large and it's very, very Gothic. And he felt that it would diminish the house if you saw both buildings in the same landscape. So he particularly plants to screen the house. So you don't see the house when you first arrive. You first see the stables. But the really interesting object that everybody in the 18th century was really excited about is the cromlech, which you can see on the right-hand side, um, which we call the druidical remains. In the 18th century, Wales was seeking an identity and undergoing something of a Welsh renaissance. And they were particularly looking for some ancestors for the Welsh um, poets and bards. And they felt the Druids were the true ancestors of the Welsh poets and the praise poets and the bards. So there was a lot of interest in all the old stones, which they didn't really understand the archaeology of. And they supposed that, um, some of them supposed that this might have been a sacrificial altar for the Druids to carry out their human sacrifices. Um, this was drawn in 1781 by Moses Griffiths, just to show that this interest in these stones had been established for some time. And the Druids were always meant to have met in a, in a, wood, in a woodland or oak grove. And it originally had a different name. Some people were quite dismayed that Lord Newborough called it Plas Newith, the new house, because they felt the old name, Cluin Mole, um, was a much better name. And this is a depiction of um, a Druid in, on Anglesey, um, and some of the other pictures that were done of this particular cromlech. It's a very important cromlech. They thought maybe this had been the last stand of the Druids against the, against the Romans. And, and there's lots and lots of pictures you'll see. And this is the one that um, Humphrey Repton drew. And when he saw it, he felt he had to factor the cromlech into the landscape. And um, he felt the stables were really built much too closely to it. So he does sort of frame the um, plantation around it. But in Repton's day, it had this huge ash tree. And this is part of the romance of this particular stone. It had this big ash tree. And in this picture, you can see just on the... Um, left-hand side, a little bit of the new stables that's really built very much too close to it. And one of the things that happened just before Repton arrived was there had been damage done to it, which Repton seemed to have felt was actually vandalism. And it could well have been because people climbed all over the cromlet, they measured it, they wanted to work out whether it was a burial or whether it was a sacrificial altar. And I think Repton had a very modern idea that he would fix it with a new block of marble which would be inscribed um, to preser preserve a druidical monument which is of a date before the Christian era though lately endangered by wanton mischief and because there was no English heritage or cadu he added by the order of Earl of Uxbridge in the year of Christ 1799. So it shows an aspect of Repton where he's interested in actually um, conservation, restoration, and saving a historic heritage. And the other thing is, is there's one other monument at um, Plasneuth connected also. Um, oh, these are ideas he had for a new gateway, a new entrance to Plasneuth. But there's another, um, another landscape feature, which is another cairn. And there'd been an attempt to flatten it because um, his father thought, um, the Elephax, which father thought it was just a, uh, created by rubble. 
and they've discovered bones. And some people thought these were the bones of the prisoners that would have been sacrificed on the Cromlech had it been a, a sacrificial altar. So this was also very important, but interestingly, this isn't featured really in the design landscape. It's just left in a field where it survives today. Um, he did reorganize the drives, the approaches to um, Plasnuith, but I think he was frustrated because there was not so much that he could really do there. So he proposed this um, greenhouse come pavilion, which is shown in his observations. Um, and it's interesting because he, it never got built. But it does suggest his interest in enjoying the landscape in an evening by moonlight. It's one of the few night scenes, I think, that we have by Repton. And then the last landscape that we have in, um, in Wales is perhaps the one that's most pure um, in that it survives more or less intact as, um, as designed by Repton and his son, Aidy. And it's the last of the three Welsh certain Repton landscapes. And it's, um, it's a landscape that he felt was in a beautiful place. He talks about the genius of, of Stanage. And he also talks about how to do this property within the bounds of good taste because he felt that there wasn't enough money to do really what he wanted to do. Um, this is the design. He actually incorporates the old house and tries to preserve as much as he possibly can because he is worried that this family might not have a house that's big enough. He feels that it shouldn't be a villa and it should have some sense of magnificence and so he's trying to make the biggest sort of house he possibly can. It's pretty much like that today, except the arcade's been sort of filled in. And he talks in um, some of his writing about how that is one of the things he did also propose. And Stanage Park sits on a really wide, huge terrace. Um, Something he writes about is the right kind of trees to go with architecture. He talks about with classical design needing to have rounded trees and how he thought pines and conifers suited Gothic design better. And really at Stanish Park you have both. But he is very disparaging of new red brick villas in the vicinity of Ludlow. And he He's very keen not to have um, sort of big pine plantations. He advocates oak and, and chestnut particularly. Um, so this is the house um, as you see it today. And this is the main front. And it's got, it's got a big terrace. And it's got um, a ha-ha, which you overlook, across a valley. Um, and that's a sort of aerial view, giving you an idea of the layout. So you can see the right of the house, you've got a very big terrace overlooking the valley. And then the gardens are to the south and, and north of the house, you've got more woodland. And there's a very big lake. And again, at Stanish Park, he does a lot of water management. Um, and it's... Perhaps the house that's most connected with Downton. Um, Downton is the house of Payne Knight and of Downton Castle. And he is certainly influenced by the relatives of the family. So it's interesting to know how much of the taste is the taste of the, um, the patron or the taste of Repton. But in his Red Book, he talks about the presence of the Deer Park and keeping the East Drive as a Holloway. And then he wants the lines of the designed landscape to be straight and in contrast to the, the valleys and shapes of the hills either side. So that's the lake behind the house. It's still very beautiful. And there's really a sense that you're in a Repton landscape. Um, the planting took some time to get going because... Um, 
it was a massive amount of planting, and he was worried about the, plant, the trees that had already been felled on the site. On one hillside, he talks about putting it down to bracken, and we don't know whether this was ever done. And so the streams were managed. Um, I like the idea that stagnations are pools where you would be able to have a sense of contemplation. And that's... Uh, a Repton entrance onto the terrace. And that's the view from the terrace across some of the landscape at Stanish Park. That's the last one. So that's Wales, and that's Repton in Wales. Thank you.